Hello again, friends. This is Marilyn from tarotclarity.com, and welcome back to my tarot parlor. Today's video will be the first in a series of videos um, that will explore how the meanings of the numbers of the minor arcana may or may not be influenced by the corresponding numbered cards of the major arcana of a deck of tarot. I believe this will be especially insightful to those readers who primarily read from the old style old school style of TDM, which simultaneously refers to both the early Italian Taroki decks out of Milan or Northern Italy, um, as well as to the decks a century two later out of Marseille, France. Bear in mind that what I have to offer is purely based on my own experience and observation of self-study and may or may not be agreed by, uh, may or may not be agreed with by others, including yourself. Having said that, this will be the first video in the series, as I mentioned, that will consider the numerical values of the pip cards and how they may or may not relate to the cards of the major arcana. Okay, I fooled you. Although he isn't in the count of the numbered cards, any time is as good a time as any to introduce the fool card. He typically has no number assignment, though he is sometimes referred to as number zero or number 22. Now the fool floats through the tarot deck as a jester in a Mardi Gras parade would. In fact, in the 1960s, Gertrude Moakley was the first tarot scholar who recognized that the major trump cards in a tarot deck were the same cast of characters in medieval triumph floats in parade pageants the week before Lent in medieval Italy. Think about that. Of all, the tarot, the, of all the prior tarot experts and occultists who claimed to know the secrets of the ancient deck of cards and claimed their direct lineage to ancient Egypt, the Kabbalah, astrology, and alchemy, she was the first to point out that its cast of characters was the same as the characters in a Petrarch poem that medieval Italians demonstrated every year in parades for God knows how long. Once you see that connection, there's no unseeing it. She put the cards squarely in their correct historical context, which had nothing to do with occult theories or agendas. If you think of a modern deck of playing cards, the fool might be recognized as the joker who now, as in the early days of playing Taroki, is a wild card. In the game of Taroki, as its modern joker counterpart, the fool, the fool or the joker excuses the player who possesses him from having to lay a card from the suit being played. In essence, the fool could be said to assume the properties of the card that it's replacing. The appearance of the fool disrupts the flow of the game of Taroki, allowing the next player to change the suit being played. Because of this historic context of the fool in a game of Taroki, one can clearly see how the meaning of this card evolved to mean spontaneity, rule-breaking, risk-taking, and elements of chance in the interpretation of a tarot reading. And because the fool can be said to mimic the cards that surround it in a game of cards, it isn't difficult then to see how the fool likewise lends itself to amplify the meanings of other cards surrounding it in a tarot reading. An example, if the fool appears in a, in a spread surrounded by several pages, it might suggest immaturity or a reference to several youngsters uh, or even the arrival of unexpected news, depending on the nature of the question asked. Its evolution from its historic roots is evident. Now think about that for a second while you look at the fool from the Visconti Sforza deck of, Tur of, uh, of Turaki, Turogi. Um, this is the oldest known existing tarot deck from the mid-1400s. There may very well be older decks, but this is the oldest known surviving deck. In this deck, the fool is depicted as a vagabond with a club. He wears ragged clothes, has feathers haphazardly arranged in his hair, and he stands before a crevice. He appears to be a man with nothing to lose, which, as we've already noted, makes him the most dangerous card in the deck. Now check out the fool of the Estanzi tarot deck of the late 1400s. I think it's like 1490. He's got donkey ears, um, which kind of remind me of the naughty and foolish children in the Pinocchio story. You see them? In this card, the village children are throwing stones at him. 
He's barely dressed, and in fact, his pubic hairs are visible, which suggests that he's vulgar in polite society. And he's actually pretty creepy in this particular card since he's parading like that in front of children. Um, but that's probably my impression as a 21st century viewer. It might not have been um, thought of as creepy to someone in the 15th century. I don't know. Now let's compare both of these fools um, to the fool from the Noble Tarot deck coming out of Marseille about 150 years later in 1650. The Noble is arguably the oldest of the existing Marseille decks. Notice that this fool also appears as a vagabond. This time he's carrying a satchel instead of a club. Notice how his entire backside and genitalia are exposed by an attacking dog. Because of this detail, it's clear that the dog is not his pet, but rather an attack dog. There is no precipice, crevice, or cliff evident in this card. The dog chases him away and literally exposes him to the villagers as a, as a stranger or a threat to their community. Like the Estensi fool, he has bells on his hat, and I think on the Estensi there may be one on his hat. I'm not sure if that's a bell, but clearly these things look like bells. Um, you know, and he's reminiscent of a court jester. Is the fool a character who has fallen from grace um, within the court? in these particular cards, or are his bells meant to alert the villagers that he's in the vicinity? It's interesting to me that in both the Estensi and the early Noble card, um, there is a visual reference to the sexual region of the character's body. Does this imply that those early decks were referencing a sexual threat as well? Who knows? That is not really apparent in this Visconti, uh, Visconti Sforza deck, although he is in his undergarments. Um, which might be as risque as that particular artist was willing to present this character to the aristocratic family who commissioned him. A sexual connotation to the fool, if there was any, is lost to history. Finally, let's look at the 1JJ Swiss tarot deck from about 1860. By now, we clearly see the fool as he is presented, um, you know, very similarly to our current day playing card joker. He's dressed as a court jester. There is no dog or cliff. It's fascinating but that by the 19th and 20th centuries, and I, I'm sure I don't need to show you a card from the Rider Waite Smith um, fool. Here he is, but I'll do it anyway for the sake of prospe uh, prosperity. Um, it's fascinating that by the 19th and 20th centuries, the dog reappears um, with the fool in a tarot deck, um, but this time it's the fool's companion and not an attack dog. The fool apparently has evolved from a vagabond into a rather well-dressed character on the precipice of self-discovery. This evolution might be explained by different cultures, individuals, or even card makers who might have unintentionally misinterpreted the images or others who deliberately reinterpreted and changed the images of the cards to reinforce their esoteric agendas. The 18th century French have claimed credit for seeing the potential of the Taroki deck as a vehicle for divination. But is it so impossible to dismiss the concept that the cards were used in Italy, Italian society for the same purpose, only that they were confined uh, by the, uh, you know, they were confined to private quarters, um, you know, like their private parlors due to the very dangerous religious restrictions of their time and place. I mean, think about that. Late 18th century France was the perfect time and place for the card's divinatory purposes to, to become public. At that time, France was, was a time and place of revolution and uncertainty. People were less fearful of the monarchy and religious persecution, obviously, and everyone wanted to know what their fates would be. Would their heads end up on the guillotine? <laughs> They may have been the first to come out of the fortune-telling closet, but I don't think they were the first to use the cards for divinatory purposes. Please give this video a thumbs up and, and subscribe to my channel to stay tuned for the next video in this series, the number one in the deck of tarot. Until next time, thank you for watching and peace.